Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. We're stoked to have as our guest today, Bill Donahue, and he's gonna be, we're going to be discussing with him his new book, War on Virtue. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. You know, my one of my books is called Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And I think that if we look at the, the basic seven virtues, there's the four cardinal virtues of justice, self-mastery, or some people would call it prudence, uh, fortitude, uh, and um, forgetting what I'm justice, self-mastery, fortitude, and prudence, the charioteer of the virtues, which Socrates, Plato, Aristotle promulgated for us around 500 BC. And then St. Paul uh, mentioned three others, the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And those infused virtues, which the Lord gives to us, uh, empower us and enable us to be able to uh, have that happy life, which Aristotle said the the uh, the uh, pursuit of virtue is the key to happiness. And, uh, and so we have someone here with us who looks like the happiest person in the world right now. He's someone who's a little bit wishy-washy in what he says, somewhat <laughs> reticent. Uh, we have, I'm, I'm so unbelievably stoked to have with us today, Bill Donahue, and we're going to be talking about his new book, The War on Virtue. Aloha, Bill. Aloha. How are you? Thank you for having me on, Bear. I just, I just love having you here. I just, I'm looking at your books behind you. Most of those are your books. Yes, this is my 10th book. And uh, I just, I don't know. I just seem to still have the energy. God gave me uh a lot of it, so I'm expending it the best I can. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's with you. I don't think it's energy. It's like, oh, I can't keep this in. I got to get this out. You know, that's true. Uh, got fi- but a fire in your belly and, and in your spirit. You know, but we we like to talk story here a little bit about who our guest is. I mean, you've. I think it's really cool uh, your history uh, in the Air Force and and as a teacher in Spanish Harlem. I don't want you to give me a resume so much as can you tell me? I mean, and, and then all the way to a PhD. From New York University, and and of course, an honorary doctor at the Ave Maria School of Law. Can you tell us about those first days, though, Air Force and Harlem? I think that I think that set the stage for you, the virtue learned in the military, and then your experience, you know, in Spanish Harlem at a Catholic well, school. Quite frankly, I really grew up in the Air Force because I came from a fatherless home, and I was always in trouble in school. Uh, I was almost thrown out of elementary school, suspended from high school, got thrown out of college. Um, there was a nice pub across the street. Why did, you get thrown, why did you get thrown out of elementary school? And co- <laughs> what well, happened? Every, every, every Friday, my mother was down there to meet with the nuns. Was You either got an S for satisfaction, a satisfactory grade for conduct, or you got a U for unsatisfactory. I never once saw an S in all my years. <laughs> And so if my if my mother wasn't meeting with the principal, she was meeting with the teacher as to what's wrong with Billy. And then Billy got suspended from high school. I graduated 69th out of 72 students, got thrown out of college. And uh, I was why just did you get thrown out. out of, why did you get thrown out of college? Because there was a bar across the street called Poor Richard's Pub. And I spent my time there. Well, that sounds like a great place to to meet interesting people <laughs> and write and write books. But but uh, I remember getting in trouble at a Catholic school. Were you at a Catholic school? And and it was Mother Superior. Yes. She was so scary to get sent into her office. Oh my gosh! It would all- well, yeah, I I wasn't afraid because I was I was always in trouble and they always brought me in. But anyhow, when I got in the Air Force at the age of nineteen during the Vietnam War period, uh, I kind of grew up real fast. And I got deep into the uh, black civil rights movement, largely because I was a big jazz aficionado. Oh. And you can't know anything about jazz without following blacks. And then the civil rights movement hit. And all of a sudden, I started reading more and more and more and more about the black experience. And I had a left wing turn, believe it or not, during that period, my young period. And I came out and I, and I went, went to uh, NYU and I finished three years of college in two years, worked, worked in Spanish Harlem. 
And uh, I came to my senses realizing that liberals were mostly phonies. They were hypocrites and they didn't have uh, didn't have an ounce of, of common sense. And so I got back to my, I guess, my early roots, more or less working class roots. And I went to work in Spanish Hall. I mean, even though I could have got a much better paying job as an accountant after learning uh, accounting for four years in the Air Force. But I'd rather work with the black and Puerto Rican kids in a rough neighborhood. And I loved it. That's a, I'm a CPA, by the way, so I consider that an insult. But, you know, so 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 at least you've settled down. You don't get in trouble anymore, do you? Actually, I spent my entire life getting into trouble, <laughs> except now I rebel against the nuns who used to train me to be a good guy. No, those oh, yeah. are the ones on the left. Yeah, because no, the, they, uh, no I, I've always been in trouble. And, uh, and and quite frankly, I really don't care. I'm not involved in a popularity contest at the Catholic League. Uh, I'm here to tell the truth. That's what we are called to do as Catholics, as you well know, Bear. We are called to tell truth. And, and there, and, and but, 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 but I got to object with you right there, Bill, because you know, truth is relative, right? <laughs> well, if truth is relative, then, <laughs> then we're finished. Because Hitler himself said that there's no such thing as truth. And uh, you know, if you believe that, you that that's what the left wing postmodernists believe. They have a lot in common with Hitler. And didn't Pilate say something like, well, what is truth, kind of sarcastically, to Jesus, who stood right before him, and he said, I am the truth. Right. Yeah, and Pilate still didn't get it. And they don't get it in the universities today. Uh, like I say, you know, there, there's people say we should depopulate the asylums. I think we need to build more of them, and we should put a lot of the college professors in there, put them in straight jackets and take them off to Bellevue, because they live in a world which doesn't make any sense at all. I, I made a comment last Thursday night at the 50th anniversary of the Catholic League, I was talking about a particular postmodernist uh, philosopher. Her name is Lori Calhoun. Now, her name won't mean much to most people, but she was asked a question since she doesn't believe in truth. Are, are, are giraffes taller than ants? And her answer was, no, that's just a fiction created by religion in our culture. It's kind of like going back to that statement, all Cretans are liars. You know, it's like an infinite loop of, <laughs> of confusion. We're talking with Bill Donahue. What a thrill to have you on our show and his new book, War on Virtue, uh, published by Sophia Institute. So so what, what is the basic thesis of, of the book, uh, War on Virtue? I studied uh, why is it that some people in certain demographic groups as well do well in our society as measured by educational and economic achievement. And I came to the conclusion that while all the virtues are important, and you mentioned seven of them before, uh, there are three that I would argue that you have to possess if you're going to be a success in any walk of life, whether you're a baker or a politician, a dentist, it doesn't make any difference. You have to accept personal responsibility for your actions. You have to exercise self-discipline or self-control, and you must be able to persevere the virtue of perseverance. Now, those three, if you embody them, don't guarantee success, but I can guarantee you, you won't be a success as an athlete or in any capacity of society unless you embody those virtues. And I found four groups who absolutely are emblematic of them, and they would be Asians, Jews, uh, Nigerians, and Mormons. Those four uh, excel in the vital virtues and that's why they they're, they're they're on top. So when you so how do you define success then? Well, pretty much the standard American way, which is to say, educationally, did you get a college degree, for example, or or perhaps more? Uh, economically, would expect you at least to be the, the middle class. Uh, people who live a comfortable lifestyle. Uh, what about people be... holding their families together? Well, Relationship well, that, success. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because you know. Uh, fellow who, who who came up with the whole idea back in in, in the early uh, last century, um, he talked about the American dream as being more than economic and educational success. That there was something interior as well, and that people have to possess some kind of sense of virtue and be a good person. Character matters. So yes, that matters too. So if you are uh, someone who uh, doesn't embody the vital virtues, and you just happen to uh, uh, hit the lottery. And in otherwise, you, you live a, an irresponsible lifestyle. No, they, they wouldn't be part of the, the, the composition of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people here for the most part. They have sinners like everybody else, obviously. But uh, you have good people and bad people well, in every walk of life. But you know, the, the, the way we understand it today. 
You know, the Catholic Catechism <laughs> says that a life of virtue provides us uh, with a life of ease. Now, I don't think they mean easy. I think what the, the Catechism is saying is there that your life is in order. You're, you're pursuing the virtue. You're pursu pursuing your true end, your true purpose. And so things are in alignment. Uh, decisions are easy because uh, you're pursuing the true good. And then, but you may have the challenge that it's going to be usually a lot of times pursuing the true good is the hardest thing you can do, but there's a certain ease to it because you know you're right. And someone who's, who's, who's in the right just keeps on coming because they, they have an inward a knower way down inside their knower that what they're doing is the right thing. So there's a certain order. And what I mean by order is uh, God's order. When you put things, when you're moving in God's order, uh, that's a, good way to define uh, maybe perhaps to some degree what success is. We're talking with Bill Donahue, his new book, The War on Virtue. We apologize for his being so wishy-washy. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Now you can journey with other men on the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue through Bear's Man Cave community in our three-year school of manliness. Join at deepadventure.com. Better yet, you can lead your own sons through the same compelling video, audio, and written content. Can you imagine how much deeper your relationship with your dad could have been and how much more you could have learned and pitfalls you might have avoided if your dad had a tool like this to help to draw you both into a deeper, life-changing discussion? Now you have a trigger that you can pull that will take you into gritty discussions with other men and with your sons at Deep Adventure. Dot com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24 hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to Notre Dame fcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul. Both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com, and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guest today is Bill Donahue, and I think he's going to like uh, what I'm about to introduce to you. You know, at uh, deepadventure.com, our website, we have Bear's School of Manliness. Uh, it's there for, for so many men who really don't have deep relationships or want to go deeper with God and with other men. You can go there and you become part of our man cave. We, we have a, a, a our own version of Facebook, our own private Facebook, where we challenge each other, encourage each other, inspire each other, share our hold our beer type moments. But we also have a three year curriculum there on manliness, which we all go through together. Uh, uh, there's three, there's, there's video, there's audio, there's written content, there's self, self assessment there. And right now we're going through year two, month four, uh, about as a men need to be dangerous. Uh, we have a very dangerous guest with us today, Bill Donahue, by the way. But we go through that together. But then what's really cool about that is the men can get their sons a sign-on uh, password as well, access, not to the man cave. They can't join the man cave. That's for adults. But the, the men can lead their sons through this curriculum on manliness. And for the mama bears out there, the single moms out there, uh, they can provide this curriculum to their sons too. So we're really stoked about this, 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 uh, the new adventure that we're talking about, the, the school of manliness. And it's all based uh, on the whole cowboy 
uh, virtue. Uh, my my newest book coming out with Sophia is Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? 12 Rules for Manliness. So it's something that I that uh, kind of put, putting um, getting men kind of excited. So go to deepadventure.com. Join us there, please. Uh, it's all based ba- basically this whole our whole curriculum is based on Bill Donahue's life. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome me- to the show there, cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, our society should be building up manliness instead it's tearing it down. And one of the subtext in, in my book is that uh, the ruling elite in our society, that is to say the ruling class, the decision makers in most of the institutions in our society, they have pretty much given up on encouraging the vital virtues of self-discipline, perseverance, and self-control. And instead, and personal responsibility, instead they're working against it. And no group, no demographic group has been harmed more than African-Americans. Basically, my point is this. African-Americans do not need to fear the crazy right-wing white supremacists. There's so few of them. They need to fear the people who are mostly white and who are well-educated and who claim to represent their best interest. They have become the real racists. I say that because they don't really believe that blacks can compete like the other groups that I've mentioned, that they can't possess the vital virtues. And so we're going to push them across the finish line. They have low expectations. They're condescending, patronizing, uh, white left-wing thinkers. And they are the enemy of black people in and this that's country. The racist. Yeah. That's the racist. That's the condescending racist yep. right there. Right. And, and, and they, they've broken up the family. The black family survived, it wasn't all strong, but it survived through the worst days of slavery and racial discrimination, even as late as the 1950s. It was relatively strong. It wasn't until the 60s, with the welfare dependency that created that state, which gave the man an opportunity and invitation to leave, and so his wife and his children would be better off economically with him out of the household, but once he leaves, he doesn't come back. In terms of welfare <laughs> and things like that, right? The, Absolutely. The man leaves. Yes. The, the, yeah. It was it was a setup. It was, it a, was setup. a setup. I'm glad you used the word setup there because, yes, there were some people who meant well and had, had good intentions when it went awry. But as I detail in The War and Virtue, there were other people, people like Richard Cloward and Fra- Francis Fox Piven, two Columbia professors. They were married. And they were arguing that we could use blacks as basically as pawns, as tools to create a political revolution in our society. And if we could break up New York City by getting everybody onto welfare, the federal government would have no other choice but to come in and institute socialism. So they exploited black people for their own uh, uh, political pursuits. That's not a matter of making a mistake. They knew exactly what they were doing. And now we're seeing that identity type politics. It's not just um, are you part of the black community, but all these subgroups. If you're part of this group, then there's there's uh, there's uh, prejudice against you, and it goes all the way back to you know this whole thing of virtue signaling. Like you know you, you don't know who what someone's going to take offense at. What's the mo- the latest fad at what to take offense at? It's kind of like that selective outrage I've heard about. But you know the the scripture says the definition is of love is that love does not take offense. Love goes to work and helps, but it doesn't sit there and yell at the TV or judge other people in virtue signal, we actually strive to to live a life of virtue. We're talking with Bill Donahue, his new book, War on Virtue. Well, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the best example I could give to just punctuate your point, which is an excellent one, I wrote a book with my, for Sophia a few years back, uh, coming up with her centenary, I wrote a book called Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics. I wound up debating it several times before he passed away. But my point is this, Mother Teresa, I loved her because people would say, I can't save everybody. She said, don't try to save the whole world. Save one. Save one person. Don't, don't, and her idea of, of helping the poor was to make their life softer and easier and more graceful. She knew they would die, and she wasn't a magician. She was there to comfort them in, in their last hours. She was, she was really more of a hospice than a hospital. And quite frankly, she understood when she met Margaret Thatcher, who bragged about the welfare state. Margaret Thatcher was a great woman, but she bragged to uh, Mother Teresa about all the wonders she has of the welfare state. She said, yes, you provide for their comfort, but do you give them love? That gets back to your point earlier. Do you give them love? Of course, the state can't give love. The state can provide some means. 
which which is well, very well, necessary well, for people, particularly if they're not able-bodied. But uh, the, the difference between Mother Teresa and the socialist ones who, who always say the best way to help the poor is to pick the pocket of the rich man through taxes is that there's no skin in the game for them. They just simply take the, take the money from the rich and want to give it to the poor and play Robin Hood. Now, if you're going to be true and you, and you really do want to help the poor, you've got to have some skin in the game. You don't have to be Mother Teresa, but at least that should be your role model and not the socialist state. So you look at uh, the situation on the streets, the anarchy going on in the streets and other 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 conditions, uh, and you say, oh, the government ought to do something about it. Mother Teresa's response is you ought to you 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 do something about it. Don't just see the need in, in the government. But, you know, the government, I disagree with you on something because isn't 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 the government God? Well, they'd like you to believe that. That's that, that, that's what the socialists believe. That's why Christopher Hitchens was angry at Mother Teresa. I, as I said to Christopher, I wouldn't talk about his. On his oh, back because the man I would is love dead. to hear this. I would love to hear, but I, hear that. I, I told him, I said, listen, Mother Teresa uh, tended to the poor, which were created by you and your ideologies of socialism. <laughs> That's why you hate her. This little, this diminutive nun comes along and she's done more for the poor than all the socialist state has ever done. All you've done is generate poverty and she's been tending to, to the wounds. That's what blew, he, he blew up when I told him that. But it is true. I think. I think that that the some the secular world, um, the is an atheistic world, and so and but there is this natural inclination of man for uh, religion, and so they've made government their 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 religion and and the government their god is. Am I am I on on tack there on track there? Well, yeah. I, not only government, but I would say climate control and the climate oh, yes. change. That that's another form of religion for these people. See you. You're right. I mean, if you if you don't believe in God, then you're going to have some kind of an ersatz or substitute religion. You're going to believe in something beyond yourself, typically. And so they've latched on to you know loving the earth and whatnot. Of course, it's, we should be stewards of the earth, but we're we're we're, we're talking about people who have just simply gone off off the reservation, quite frankly. Uh, and that's largely a function of the fact that they don't have the traditional belief in God that 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 uh, j- that motivates people of faith. They've gone back to paganism. That's pantheism. I mean, that's yes, they're, they're going back to the they're, they're they're saying there is no god, but they but they but they're worshiping the earth. You know, like the work the earth's got to or worse than saying the earth's got to save us, we got to save the earth. And there is that kind of sense. And we're going to come back with Bill Donahue here in a moment of the the, the belief that they can per, that that mankind can mankind can perfect itself. That we don't need a god. We can perfect ourselves. In fact, if we can't perfect ourselves, let's make a sentient being out of a out of a robot. With artificial intelligence, and it can be perfect. We're talking. Sorry, I'm now I'm getting a little bit opinionated here. We're talking with a uh, uh, Bill Donahue, whose new book, uh, "War on Virtue." Bill, where can they find you in the book? I know the, about the Catholic League, and where can they find the book? Well, they can find it from uh, Sophia Institute Press. They can get it from Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, wherever books are sold. Um, it's available now. It's available now this week only on audiobook. So if you want to just hear me talk about the book for about six and a half hours, if you have patience enough for that, uh, then then you will be a saint. Uh, and it's also available on Kindle and on on hardback. And and where can they find you, Bill? Uh, the Catholic League. Uh, www.catholicleague.org. Just go to, type in Catholic League, the Catholic League website. You can find out right on the front page all about ordering the book. We're talking with Bill Donahue, his new book, War on Virtue, published by Sophia Publishing. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Dan Laboon Markham with another episode of Country Up at the Bishop Markham Ranch in Goldendale, Washington. Fisher Man. The Columbia River Bar, where the mighty Columbia meets the massive Pacific, is no place for wimps to work. There are hundreds of sobering reasons. Over 200 shipwrecks and many more boats met their demise. As to why this boiling cauldron of water is rightly called the Graveyard of the Pacific. My great-grandfather, a stalwart, virtuous man and lay preacher, was one of the pioneering fishermen who came to Owaka, Washington to strike a rich on salmon in the 1870s, a time when ships were made of wood and men of iron. My ancestors faced this very water in 30-foot sailboats, not unlike those on the Sea of Galilee. Give some understanding as to why Jesus chose commercial fishermen as four of the twelve apostles. Hardy souls, these men, men of perseverance, 
willing to take risks to face death and then go at it again. As you may recall, Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. Having worked on fishing boats, I know a little something about fishermen who thunder. Colorful, raw language, raw emotion, and the sheer force of will. Suffering persecution and the threat of death, those boys stood up for what was right, pushing through the storms of life. It's time for men of the church to heed the call to be men of virtue and perseverance for the sake of righteousness, ever pressing upstream with God's truth as a flow of culture pushes back against what is right, true, just, and good. Be a fisherman. Get on board and grab an oar. This is Dan Laboon Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Did you know that each Saturday morning you can receive the shareable YouTube video version of the Bear Wozniak adventure in our inspiring weekly newsletter, even before it airs on the radio or hits the podcast apps? Never miss another episode. You can even binge watch Bear's inspiring guests. Think about the impact you can have sharing these videos with your friends. Go to deepadventure.com and click the subscribe button. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your host, uh, Bear Wozniak. want to invite you. We're so stoked. Our, our season four of Long Ride Home, our motorcycle TV show, is going to begin to air on EWTN almost any week now. Uh, we're sending them the final edits. Uh, there, the, you know, you, uh, We've sent them our, our shows. They've given us their cuts that they want us to make, and we're doing the final edits right now. So it'll be released soon. But if you go to deepadventure.com and you join the Mama Bears or, or the Man Cave or subscribe to our uh, our, our Patreon at Patreon, deepadventure.com. You get all of these episodes, all of the episodes available to you, even the director's cut before they're they're even released. So, uh, and also, by the way, it's, it airs on Prime Video as well. So, long ride home with Bear Wozniak. We're stoked. Um, it really challenges men to to live life of virtue, but our biggest fans are women. The women love it because it's true and it's gritty, and it's something that they can take their husbands, their brother in laws, and the men in their lives to, and say, hey, hey, watch this. So it's, it's something that even a, a, a lot of non-Christians are walking across the living room. They see, see it airing on EWTN, and they stop. We've had a lot of men come to the Lord because there's nothing more manly than being a Christian. It's the toughest, most challenging route that you can, you can walk. If you don't believe that, take a walk down the Via de la Rosa with Jesus Christ. We're talking with Bill Donahue, the author of War on Virtue. Bill, talk, us, talk to us more about the virtues that we need to uh that we need to revive and peter dr peter craft had that book back to the virtue <laughs> we need to we need you know the modern thinkers want us to turn our back on western civilization on western thought what is it that we that that what that we need to return to we need to return to a sense of personal responsibility even if we haven't been dealt the best of cards we are responsible for our actions you can't live in a nation of victimhood. I looked at people like uh, Tiger Woods. I've looked at people like uh, the great pitcher, uh, Tom Seaver, and Michael Jordan, the basketball player, Tom Brady, the superstar. Every one of them were faced with adversity, and they didn't succeed through natural talent. They will emphasize that, particularly Brady. These people had to overcome adversity like anybody else, but they accepted responsibility from themselves. They understood the virtue of perseverance. 
like Michael Jordan says, if you see a wall and you that if if you can't get over it, you go around it. You somehow find a way to get past it. Uh, and that's the, and the, Brady struggled in high school and college, and even his first year as, as a professional. Tom Seaver was a master discipline. He understood how important self discipline, self control, or self control is, and that's why they succeeded. Not on the basis of natural ability alone. And I say the same is true of the Asians and the Nigerians and the Mormons and Jews. And notice, by the way. Asians and Nigerians, what do they have in common? They're people of color, as people like to say. In other words, it was not racial discrimination that, is, that has kept them back. They've been, been able to overcome precisely because all four of those demographic groups come from mostly intact families where there's a father and a mother. Now, the girls need a father, yes, but boy, did the boys need the father. They need the discipline. Males have more testosterone than girls. They tend to be more aggressive. If they don't have somebody to discipline them, they're going to be out in the streets. And that's why you'll see a higher crime rate amongst African-Americans than you will others, not because of race. There's nothing, it has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with coming from a one-parent family. The woman can't do it all, uh, all by herself. And so that that is very much important. And if you don't understand that, too, you have to understand, to do well in school, the people who do the most homework, they would be Asians. They come from the intact families. That takes perseverance, hard work, discipline, and, and the like. And and, and so and it, it has nothing to do with race, why we have this condition. I am saying this, though, that the white ruling class has given up on black people. They have given up on them. Let me give you a, a, a nice anecdote, which almost nobody knows about. 1850s, America's first sociologist. His name was George Fitzhugh. Fitzhugh believed that he was a left-wing progressive. He was all on the side of black Americans, and he was a big advocate of slavery. People say, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can a guy be an advocate of slavery and be on the side of black people? Because he said that they're fundamentally stupid people. They're going to cannibalize themselves. They are the happiest, freest people in the world now because the white man takes care of them. And if you ever get rid of slavery, they're going to have to compete against the white man in a market economy, and they're going to be failures. But we should keep them where they're at because we have to be kind to them. Now, people might say to me, well, that's just one guy you found out of the 1850s. Fast forward to the late 19th century. Richard Eli of the Progressive Era said pretty much the same thing. We have to take care of blacks because they're inferior to us white people. 1988 now, getting closer, Charles Murray, the social scientist, says we have the coming of a custodial democracy where the white elite will be the custodians taking care of black people because they're really not equal like the rest of us. So they will become the new wards of the state, just like the Indian reservations, except this will be in the urban areas. My point, quite frankly, is this. If you believe that black people are equal and you're not a racist, you will do as what I did when I worked in Spanish Harlem. You won't lower the bar. You will help blacks and everybody else to clear the bar. You won't have low expectations. You won't give up on them. You won't say, well, everybody else can make it, but you can't. That is a racist attitude, and it's imbued today by white liberals who consider themselves to be the biggest anti-racist in America. That's one of the great ironies, which I go to a great length in The War on Virtue to point out. You know, I'll tell you what, Bill. We're talking about Bill Donahue, his new book, The War on Virtue. It's, just, uh, it's really the new plantation, the, 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 uh, the progressive agenda is so condescending but well you know what i love here? i live here in waikiki beach i should show you right out my window advisory level surf is rising right now it's coming it's it, it's it's getting bigger my daughter and i are going to go out and surf soon but when waikiki it's not uh, disneyland is not the happiest place on earth certainly not anymore waikiki beaches though because here we see all of our families and my my bride and i cindy and i we walk along uh kalakawa avenue here and uh we see the families together and, and uh and I just love it when I see uh, um, um, when I when I see uh, the the a father with young children with a wife. You know, there maybe two babies. I always go up to the man and I say to him, "I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you that you're a father and you're taking care of your family." You know, men, young men need to be affirmed. It's a courageous thing to be a father. And when we see and but I was ta I was talking to one of my son's uh, friends. Uh, the other day, he's a he he works here here in Waikiki. We were golfing together. Very successful young man, 
and I asked him about his heritage. And he's, of course, in Hawaii, we're the most diverse heritage in the whole world. We're the most intermarried of every place in the whole world. But I said, what would you say is your predominant culture? And he said, oh, Japanese. And I told him, you know, I have to affirm that the one of the cultures that I that I admire the most is the Japanese culture. There's there's a dignity in the way that they live their lives, and there's a there's a there the, the families all seem to be um, there always seems to be a smile on the children's face, and the mother and father are always together, and it's that that it's that push, you know, and so it really is a challenge so much for for young um, uh, African Americans. Uh, where, where so often the mother is is there alone, it is a big challenge. It is tough, uh, and that's why the the biggest the I don't know what the solutions to all that are, but I think the solution is I find with young men everywhere here that they love to be challenged. If you look at the athletes, so many of our athletes uh, coming from from uh, inner city or from poor poor areas, um, there is a virtue there in their athlete in their in their commitment to excellence that goes across all lines, whether it's an athletic, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you know this, but I'm not exactly a goat like the people that you mentioned, but I did win a couple of world titles in tandem surfing. That's where I lift a woman over my head. And, and I know that uh, having done that, I got to teach a lot of, of, of young men how to do the same thing and, and how to lift a woman and compete, you know, uh, in tandem surfing. And so many of them were like, well, I can't do that. Only you can do that. I can't do that. And to just begin to work with them and inspire them and challenge them to get physically fit, to be strong mentally, to stop drinking because drinking affects your ability to synthesize protein and all the different elements that it takes to become a, a world-class athlete. Men that didn't seem to have the natural ability, no matter what their race was, were able to excel in, on the world stage in that in that particular sport. And it's true. I know in every area. I think I've talked too much. <laughs> I've got Bill Donahue with me. Why am I Why am I talking so much, Bill? Uh, Bill's new book is War on Virtue. Bill, what is where Where is uh, Where can they find you and the book? Well, they can buy. They can go on our website at catholicleague.org. Right on the front page, we're selling it. You can go to Amazon, Sophia Institute Press, uh, Barnes and Noble. Uh, it, it's it's widely available. We're talking with Bill Donahue. His new book, Warren Virtue, will be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different tally awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. When you go to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel, you get access to all of our free playlists, including hundreds of episodes of the Bear Wozniak adventure, plus the three-year journey through the whole catechism in our Ocean Sunrise Catechism series. And you even get short clips and live streaming of Baron Cindy's Adventures in Paradise videos. Go to YouTube and subscribe to the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure channel. Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Our guest is Bill Donahue, his, no book, his new book on war and virtue. We've identified some of the 
significant areas uh, of concern. What is our solution? What 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 is the pragmatic things that we can do? Is I'm I'm thinking right now education. Well, for one thing, we have to get back to the idea that there are moral absolutes. It's called the Ten Commandments. It's called the Decalogue. That there is such a thing as truth. That's where you have to begin with that. That there is such a thing but, as human nature. But those aren't in the in the in the school system anymore. They took those Ten Commandments down. They're not on the wall anymore. They, like they, they, they did, but they can at least teach the vital virtues. You, you can teach, uh, as you pointed out before. I mean, the Greeks talked about it. The Romans, Cicero talked about it. Even though the Catholic Church uh, uh, actually uh, uh, brought it to life for, for for millions of people throughout history. But there's, there's nothing ex- exclusively religious about exercising self-control and having perseverance and accepting personal responsibility. But we, but the idea of moral relativism is one of the most dreadful isms of our day. The mm. idea that every family form is the same. What? No, the, there is a blue chip. It's called the nuclear family, the much derided and castigated nuclear family of the father and the mother. I didn't say two adults. I said a father and a mother, okay, as compared to cohabiting, single parent, same sex, and and the like. That is the blue chip standard, as all the sociological studies have shown. And what do we do? We we denigrate it. If you go to the Smithsonian Institute of African American History and Culture, they will tell you that the nuclear family needs to be destroyed. That's what Black Lives Matter said as well. They say that the idea of of hard work and self-reliance the, the, that, those are expressions of whiteness, that the nuclear family is just one of many different several organizations. we got to get rid of this idea that we have to emulate the nuclear family. They're teaching this to kids in school, when in fact the sociological evidence shows just the opposite. So if you wanted to commit social suicide, you would adopt the policies of, of the white ruling class, which does believe that all alternative lifestyles are equal and is simply not true sociologically. I'm not out there to punish everybody, but I am saying there is a gold standard. It's called the nuclear family of father, mother, and children. Right now, we are doing everything we can, working overtime to denigrate that. And it shows up in crime rates. It shows up in school, in academic achievement, and in so many different ways. The idea that every person is a victim is also what the psychologists call uh, an epilepsy. Now you're impotent. You can't do anything. You're just simply a, like a slave to your passions or appetites. Many of the ideas that have become popular in our society is what I'm saying. Uh, they have to be dethroned and get back to common sense and get back to what I call the vital virtues. The three I just mentioned. Say them again. Personal responsibility. Take responsibility for yourself. Don't consider yourself to be a victim, even if you have been unfairly been given a, a bad deck, deck of cards. Self-control. Impulse control, self-discipline. You can't succeed in society in any aspect unless you exercise that. And you can't. You have to have what psychologists call grit, which is mm. perseverance. You have to be able to just keep plowing ahead, even when you run into adversity, as all of us ineluctably will. But if you exercise those virtues, like the Jews and the Asians and the Mormons and the Nigerians and everybody else who's successful, I just chose those four because. They are, they, are, they are, by any measure, the most successful people in our society. Then you're going to be a success. You have to have the intact family there. It's not a mystery. The real mystery is why the white ruling class is, has given up on black people, uh, have low expectations, condescending, patronizing attitudes, in which they wouldn't treat their own kids that way. And so people just have to kind of trust their gut these days. Uh, if somebody says something from the ruling class, which sounds to you like it's incongruous, it's incoherent, it doesn't make any sense. Trust your gut, not the expert. I love the way uh, uh, Dr. Peter Kraft uh, mentions, uh, talks about G- um, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, natural law. He says it's what Aristotle would say. It's uh, it's what your uncle would say. It's common sense, right, to, to, get, back, to get back to that. And it takes a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, a mother and a father, together in that in that family but right now what we're seeing is so many uh people that are devoted to uh to traditional moral values and principles that in the virtues they're 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 homeschooling their children or they're taking them out of the public schools and putting them into um uh christian schools that teach that some catholic schools still do um but to some degree i think the secular it used to be that religion was was 
The first universities were Catholic universities. It used to be that education was in the hands of the church, it was educating. I, I, I'm going to let you get on your soapbox one more time. What do people need to do for their children in the realm of education right now today? Well, well they have to insist, first of all, that, they, that the kids learn the virtue of self-discipline. Give you one quick example. Why do the Chinese have so many of their kids learn the violin? Not because they want them to be musicians, but because if you're learning the violin, it takes a tremendous amount of self-control. And that then carries over as a work ethic and certainly affects your, your ability to do homework. There are too many distractions with TV, the Internet, particularly with social media. And what it's done to young girls it, it, it's, it's absolutely devastating. The parents need, need to limit the amount of time that they, their kids can have on social media spend more time with them to make sure that they are doing their homework. Again, it is common sense, but we have just, we've allowed everybody to distract us from that. And we're too willing to talk about what the experts say. The experts locked us down during COVID. The experts did a lot of things that were, was bad news for our society. I'm not saying that they, they shouldn't count. I'm saying again, if the experts tell you one thing and your gut tells you another, trust your gut and not the expert. Amen, amen. You know, and so many, I think, I think to some degree, it's almost like on peeling an onion. I work in, in business and sometimes a, a, a company is so mismanaged. The more you want to peel the onion, you think, okay, I got rid of that layer of problem people. And I got that, that rid of that layer of problem uh, uh, procedures and approaches. And, I, and, and every layer kind of, you kind of weep and you cry. And finally you get down to the core and you realize it's all rotten. It's almost like we need to make a radical change. Parent, parent, most parents need to consider getting their kids out of public school, homeschooling them, or getting them into a charter school. I know it's a huge sacrifice, but but sending them into that uh, into that public school, the way some of them are run now, is just even the best of them. That uh, you know, it's it's sending them into a maelstrom of confusion, and uh, they undo everything that you're you're trying to teach them in your home. So, what do you say to parents about about just that gut level? thing about would well, you send them off to a liberal college to get educated there, there are very few very few schools left that are not on the left so you have to be very careful and, and, and very selective in choosing and if you do send your kid to a, a any any college or university all right identify there's always some identify the people who are the commonsensical ones they tend to be more conservative identify one or two of them have your child go and speak to that person for advice and in terms of what professors to take and which ones not to take, in other words, you've got to navigate this, these, these waters. But, you know, it all goes back to secularism. And you said what, what, it, it starts at the beginning. We believe in God. We believe in human nature. The secularists don't believe in God and they don't believe in human nature, which, which by the way, the reason, they, don't, the reason they, they believe there's no such thing as human nature is what accounts for the fact that they think that a man can get pregnant and give birth, the man can become a woman, a woman can become a man. It's all madness. And we should talk about what's going on with transgender kids. I'm talking about minors now. I'm talking about adults. We should call it for what it it's is. Child it's abuse. child abuse. It's yeah. child abuse. Amen. And if you believe in truth, then you know what I'm saying is true. These people are living in a world of fiction, in a world of madness, and they're destroying people. It's always a rebellion against God and nature. And oh, let's go back. Let's, let's, let's get to the heart of it, Bill. It's satanic. They're, they're, it they're, 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 Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. He can't create anything. He can only destroy. And all you can see is that every every one of these elements that you're talking about is a is a is a, a an effort, a demonic effort. I'm not saying that these people are demonized, but there is a there is an agenda, a spiritual agenda behind it. Um, Paul said, "We we war not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and in high places." Going back to our Catholic faith, Eucharistic adoration, uh, praying the Rosary to intercede. It, the battle has to start in a in a prayer time, a daily prayer time, as individuals and in our families. That's where it. Ha that's where the battle. That's the essential battle. And then to impart those virtues to your families and see to it that as far as your children's education. People that are teaching them uh, hold fast to these virtues too. We have to go, but I can ask you one more time to say those three virtues that you you say in your book, War on Virtue. We need to yes. emphasize. I call them the vital virtues: personal responsibility, perseverance, and self-control or self-discipline. 
if you embody those three and if you inculcate those virtues into your children, they will likely be a success. Please do, do so. And again, follow your gut, your instincts, and don't listen to some of the people walking around with the alphabets after their name. <laughs> well, you have a bunch of those. I know, I do. A, I but don't know. listen to but, anything Bill just said, you guys. They, 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 they tried very hard to indoctrinate me, but they failed. <laughs> You almost got you got kicked out of so many things, uh, <laughs> but uh, but you know I guess Catholics have always been countercultural. You know we've always had to, good, to swim upstream. Absolutely, we're talking with Bill Donahue, his book War on Virtue, Sophia Institute Press. Bill, I'm going to miss you. I hope we get to get you back on our show. I hope you'll in, in, you'll well, accept it. It's invitation. been my pleasure. Uh, you're a fun guy to talk to and very intelligent. Uh, thank you, my brother. Aloha. Tell, what we say in here here is on, when we sign off, we say aloha, which means to give breath. It's a way of saying I love you. So we'll say to that, we'll say to our audience, until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh I, I will I will uh get the I, I would love to send another invite out to have you on the show again. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. One, one of my favorite interviews of all time. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. Okay, my Thank brother. Ahuiho and aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.